The Giver, Chapters 3 and 4. Chapter 3. Oh, look! Lily squealed in delight. Isn't he cute? Look how tiny he is! And he has funny eyes like yours, Jonas! Jonas glared at her. He didn't like it that she had mentioned his eyes. He waited for his father to chastise Lily. The father was busy unstrapping the carrying basket from the back of his bicycle. Jonas walked over to look. It was the first thing Jonas noticed as he looked at the new child, peering up curiously from the basket. The pale eyes. Almost every citizen in the community had dark eyes. His parents did, and Lily did. And so did all of his group members and friends. But there were a few exceptions. Jonas himself, and a female five who he had noticed had the different lighter eyes. No one mentioned such things. It was not a rule. But was considered rude to call attention to things that were unsettling or different about individuals. Lily, he decided, would have to learn that soon, or she would be called in for chastisement because of her insensitive chatter. Father put his bike into its port, then he picked up the basket and carried it into the house. Lily followed behind, but she glanced back over her shoulder at Jonas and teased. Maybe she had the same birth mother as you! Jonas shrugged. He followed them inside, but he had been startled by the new child's eyes. Mirrors were rare in the community. They weren't forbidden, but there was no real need of them, and Jonas had simply never bothered to look at himself very often, even when he found himself in a location where a mirror existed. Now, seeing the new child and its expression, he was reminded that the light eyes were not only a rarity, but gave the one who had them a certain look. What was it? Depth, he decided. As if one were looking into the clear water of the river, down to the bottom where things might lurk, which hadn't been discovered yet. He felt self-conscious, realizing that he, too, had that look. He went to his desk, pretending not to be interested in the new child. On the other side of the room, Mother and Lily were bending over to watch as Father unwrapped his, its blanket. What's his comfort object called? Lily asked, picking up the stuffed creature which had been placed beside the new child in its basket. Father glanced at it. Hippo, he said. Lily giggled at the strange word. Hippo, she repeated, and put the comfort object down again. She peered at the unwrapped new child who waved his arms. I think new children are so cute, Lily sighed. I hope I get assigned to be a birth mother. Lily! Mother spoke very sharply. Don't say that. There's very little honor in that assignment. But I was talking to Natasha. You know the ten? He lives around the corner. She does some of her volunteer hours at the birthing center. And she told me that the birth mothers get wonderful food. And that they have very gentle exercise periods. And most of the time they just play games and amuse themselves while they're waiting. I think I'd like that, Lily said petulantly. Three years, Mother told her firmly. Three years, three births. And that's all. After that, they are laborers for the rest of their adult lives. Until the day that they enter the house of the old. Is that what you want, Lily? Three lazy years and then a hard physical labor until you are old? Well, no, I guess not. Lily acknowledged reluctantly. Father turned the new child onto his tummy in the basket. He sat beside it and rubbed its small back with a rhythmic motion. Anyway, Lily Billy, he said affectionately, the birth mothers never even get to see new children. If you enjoy the little ones so much, you should hope for an assignment as nurturer. When you're an eight and start your volunteer hours, you can try some at the nurturing center, Mother suggested. Yes, I think I will, Lily said. She knelt beside the basket. What did you say his name is? Gabriel? Hello, Gabriel, she said in a sing-song voice. Then she giggled. Hoots, she whispered. I think he's asleep. I guess I better be quiet. Jonas turned to the school assignments on his desk. Some chance of that, he thought. Lily was never quiet. Probably she should hope for an assignment as speaker, 
so that she could sit in the office with a microphone all day making announcements. He laughed silently to himself, picturing his sister droning on in the self-important voice that all the speakers seemed to develop, saying things like, Attention! This is a reminder to females under nine that hair ribbons are to be neatly tied at all times. He turned toward Lily and noticed to his satisfaction that her ribbons were, as usual, undone and dangling. There would be an announcement like that quite soon, he felt certain, and it would be directed mainly at Lily, though her name, of course, would not be mentioned. Everyone would know. Everyone had known, he remembered with humiliation, that the announcement, Attention! This is a reminder to male 11s that objects are not to be removed from the recreation area and that snacks are to be eaten, not hoarded, had been specifically directed at him the day last month that he had taken an apple home. No one had mentioned it, not even his parents, because the public announcement had been sufficient to produce the appropriate remorse. He had, of course, disposed of the apple and made his apology to the recreation director the next morning before school. Jonas thought again about that incident. He was still bewildered by it, not by the announcement or the necessary apology. Those were standard procedures and he had deserved them. But by the incident itself, he probably should have brought up his feeling of bewilderment that very evening when the family unit had shared their feelings of the day. But he had not been able to sort out and put words to the source of his confusion, so he had let it pass. It happened during the recreation period when he had been playing with Asher. Jonas Jonas had casually picked up an apple from the basket where the snacks were kept, and had thrown it to his friend. Asher had thrown it back, and they began a simple game of catch. There had been nothing special about it. It was an activity that he performed countless times. Throw, catch, throw, catch. It was effortless for Jonah, and even boring. Though Asher enjoyed it, and playing catch was a required activity for Asher, because it would improve his hand-eye coordination, which was not up to standards. But suddenly Jonas had noticed following the path of the apple through the air with his eyes, that the piece of fruit had, well, this was the part that he couldn't adequately understand. The apple had changed. Just for an instant. It had changed in midair, he remembered. Then it was in his hand, and he looked at it carefully. But it was the same apple, unchanged. Same size and shape, a perfect sphere. The name nondescript shade about the same shade as his own tunic. There was absolutely nothing remarkable about that apple. He tossed it back and forth between his hands a few times, then thrown it again to Asher, and again in the air, for an instant only, it had changed. It happened four times. Jonas had blinked, looked around, and then tested his eyesight, squinting at the small print on the identification badge attached to his tunic. He read his name quite clearly. He could also clearly see Asher at the other end of the throwing area, and he had had no problem catching the apple. Jonas had been completely mystified. Ash, he had called. Does anything seem strange to you about the apple? Yes, Asher called back laughing. It jumps out of my hand onto the ground. Asher had just dropped it once again. So Jonas laughed too, and with his laughter tried to ignore his uneasy conviction that something had happened. But he had taken the apple home against the recreation area rules. That evening, before his parents and Lily arrived at the dwelling, he had held it in his hands and looked at it carefully. It was slightly bruised now, because Asher had dropped it several times. But there was nothing at all unusual about the apple. He had held a magnifying glass to it. He had tossed it several times around the room, watching and then rolled it around and around on his desktop, waiting for the thing to happen again. But it hadn't. The only thing that happened was the announcement later that evening over the speaker. The announcement that had singled him out without using his name, that had caused both of his parents to glance meaningfully at his desk, where the apple still lay. Now, sitting at his desk, staring at his schoolwork as his family hovered over the new child in its basket, he shook his head, trying to forget the odd incident. 
he forced himself to arrange his papers and tried to study a little before the evening meal. The new child, Gabriel, stirred and whimpered, and father spoke softly to Lily, explaining the feeding procedure as he opened the container that held the formula and equipment. The evening proceeded as all evenings did in the family unit, in the dwelling, in the community. Quiet, reflective, a time for renewal and preparation for the day to come. It was different only in the addition to it of the new child, with his pale, solemn, knowing eyes. Chapter 4 Jonas rode at a leisurely pace, glancing at the bike ports besides the buildings to see if he could spot Asher's. He didn't often do his volunteer hours with his friend because Asher frequently fooled around and made serious work a little difficult. But now, with 12 coming so soon and the volunteer hours ending, it didn't seem to matter. The freedom to choose where to spend those hours had always seemed a wonderful luxury to Jonas. Other hours of the day were so carefully regulated. He remembered when he had become an eight, as Lily would do shortly, and had been faced with that freedom of choice. The eights always set out on their first volunteer hour, a little nervously, giggling and staying in groups of friends. They almost invariably did their hours on recreation duty first, helping with the younger ones in a place where they still felt comfortable. But with guidance as they developed self-confidence and maturity, they moved on to other jobs, gravitating towards those that would suit their own interests and skills. A male 11 named Benjamin had done his entire nearly four years in the rehabilitation center, working with citizens who had been injured. It was rumored that he was as skilled now as the rehabilitation directors themselves, and that he had even developed some machines and methods to hasten rehabilitation. There is no doubt that Benjamin received his assignment to that field and would probably be permitted to bypass most of the training. Jonas was impressed by the things Benjamin had achieved. He knew him, of course, since they had always been group mates. But they had never talked about the boy's accomplishments because such a conversation would have been awkward for Benjamin. There was never any comfortable way to mention or discuss one's successes without breaking the rule against bragging, even if one didn't mean to. It was a minor rule, rather like rudeness, punishable only by gentle chastisement. But still, better to steer clear of an occasion governed by a rule, which would be so easy to break. The area of dwellings behind him, Jonas rode past the community structures hoping to spot Asher's bicycle, parked beside one of the small factories or office buildings. He passed the child care center where Lily stayed after school, and the play area surrounding it. He strode through the central plaza and the lodge auditorium where public meetings were held. Jonas slowed and looked at the name tags on the bicycles lined up outside the nurturing center. Then he checked those outside food distribution. It was always fun to help with the deliveries, and he hoped he would find his friend there so that they could go together on the daily rounds, carrying the cartons of supplies into the dwellings of the community. But he finally found Asher's bicycle leaning, as usual, instead of upright in its port, as it should have been at the House of the Old. There was only one other child's bicycle there, that of a female 11 named Fiona. Jonas liked Fiona. She was a good student, quiet and polite, but she had a sense of fun as well, and it didn't surprise him that she was working with Asher today. He parked his bicycle neatly in the port besides theirs and entered the building. Hello, Jonas, the attendant at the front desk said. She handed him the sign-up sheet and stamped her own official seal behind his signature. All of his volunteer hours would be carefully tabulated at the Hall of Open Records. Once, long ago, it was whispered among the children, and Eleven had arrived at the ceremony of twelve, only to hear a public announcement that he had not completed the required number of volunteer hours and would not, therefore, be given his assignment. He had been permitted an additional month in which to complete the hours and then given his assignment privately, with no applause, no celebration a disgrace that had clouded his entire future. It's good to have some volunteers here today, the attendant told him. We celebrated a release this morning, and that always throws the schedule off a little, so things get backed up. She looked at the printed sheet. 
Let's see. Asher and Fiona are helping in the bathing room. Why don't you join them there? You know where it is, don't you? Jonas nodded, thanked her, and walked down the long hallway. He glanced at the rooms on either side. The old were sitting quietly, some visiting and talking with one another, others doing handwork and simple crafts. A few were asleep. Each room was comfortably furnished. The floors covered with thick carpeting. It was a serene and slow-paced place. Unlike the busy centers of manufacture and distribution, where the daily work of the community occurred. Jonas was glad that he had, over the years, chosen to do his hours in a variety of places so that he could experience the differences. He realized, though, that not focusing on one area meant he was left with not the slightest idea, not even a guess, of what his assignment would be. He laughed softly. Thinking about the ceremony again, Jonas, he teased himself. But he suspected that with the date so near, probably all of his friends were too. He passed a caretaker walking slowly with one of the old in the hall. Hello, Jonas, the young uniformed man said, smiling pleasantly. The woman beside him, whose arm he held, was hunched over as she shuffled along in her soft slippers. She looked toward Jonas and smiled, but her dark eyes were clouded and blank. He realized she was blind. He entered the bathing room with its warm, moist air and scent of cleansing lotions. He removed his tunic, hung it carefully on the wall hook, and put on the volunteer smock that was folded on a shelf. Hi, Jonas! Asher called from the corner, where he was kneeling beside a tub. Jonas saw Fiona nearby at a different tub. She looked up and smiled at him, but she was busy, gently washing a man who lay in the warm water. Jonas greeted them and the caretaking attendants at work nearby. Then he went to the row of pouted lounging chairs where others of the old were waiting. He had worked here before. He knew what to do. Your turn, Larissa, he said, reading the name tag on the woman's robe. I'll just start the water and then help you up. He pressed the button on a nearby empty tub and watched as the warm water flowed in through the many small openings on the sides. The tub would be filled in a minute and the water would and the water flow would stop automatically. He helped the woman from the chair, led her to the tub, removed her robe, and steadied her with his hand on her arm as she stepped in and lowered herself. She leaned back and sighed with pleasure, her head on a soft, cushioned headdress. Comfortable? he asked, and she nodded. Her eyes closed. Jonah squeezed cleansing lotion onto the clean sponge at the end of the tub and began to wash her frail body. Last night he had watched as his father bathed the new child. This was much the same. The fragile skin, the soothing water, the gentle motion of his hand, slippery with soap. The relaxed, peaceful smile on the woman's face reminded him of Gabriel being bathed. And the nakedness, too. It was against the rules for children or adults to look at another's nakedness. But the rule did not apply to new children or the old. Jonas was glad. It was a nuisance to keep oneself covered while changing for games, and the required apology if one had by mistake glimpsed another's body was always awkward. He couldn't see why it was necessary. He liked the feeling of safety here in this warm and quiet room. He liked the expression of trust on the woman's face as she lay in the water, unprotected, exposed, and free. From the corner of his eye, he could see his friend Fiona, helped the old man from the tub and tenderly pat his thin, naked body dry with an absorbent cloth. She helped him into his robe. Jonas thought Larissa had drifted into sleep, as the old often did, and he was careful to keep his motions steady and gentle so he wouldn't wake her. He was surprised when she spoke, her eyes still closed. This morning we celebrated the release of Roberto, she told him. It was wonderful. I knew Roberto, Jonas said. I helped him with his feeding the last time I was here just a few weeks ago. He was a very interesting man. Larissa opened her eyes happily. They told his whole life before they released him, she said. They always do. But to be honest, she whispered with a mischievous look, some of the tellings are a little boring. I've even seen some of the old fall asleep during tellings. 
when they released Edna recently. Did you know Edna? Jonas shook his head. He couldn't recall anyone named Edna. Well, they tried to make her life sound meaningful, and of course, she added primly, all lives are meaningful. I don't mean that they aren't, but Edna, my goodness, she was a birth mother, and then she worked in food production for years until she came here. She never even had a family unit. Larissa lifted her head and looked around to make sure no one else was listening. Then she confided, I don't think Edna was very smart. Jonas laughed. He rinsed her left arm, laid it back into the water, and began to wash her feet. She murmured with pleasure as he massaged her feet with the sponge. But Roberta's life was wonderful, Larissa went on after a moment. He had been an instructor of Eleven's. You know how important that is. And he'd been on the planning committee and... Goodness, I don't know how he found the time. He also raised two very successful children, and he was also the one who did the landscaping design for the Central Plaza. He didn't do the actual labor, of course. Now on your back. Lean forward and I'll help you sit up. Jonas put his arm around her and supported her as she sat. He squeezed the sponge against her back and began to rub her sharp bone shoulders. Tell me about the celebration. Well, there was the telling of his life. That is always first. Then the toast. We all raised our glasses and cheered. We chanted the anthem. He made a lovely goodbye speech, and several of us made little speeches wishing him well. I didn't, though. I've never been fond of public speaking. He was thrilled. You should have seen the look on his face when they let him go. Jonas slowed the strokes of his hand on her back thoughtfully. Larissa? He asked. What happens when they make the actual release? Where exactly did Roberto go? She lifted her bare wet shoulders in a small shrug. I don't know. I don't think anybody does, except for the committee. He just bowed to all of us and then walked like they all do through the special door in the releasing room. But you should have seen his look. Pure happiness, I'd call it. Jonas grinned. I wish I'd been there to see it. Larissa frowned. I don't know why they don't let children come. Not enough room, I guess. They should enlarge the releasing room. We'll have to suggest that to the committee. Maybe they'd study it, Jonas said slyly, and Larissa chortled with laughter. Right, she hooted, and Jonas helped her from the tub. <laughs>